very much for inviting me and also thank you for that overly kind introduction. I have something to live up to now and I don't think you want to see me sing or dance. <laughs> My brief today was to talk about frontiers in MS research. <coughs> and what I'm trying to do is to, to bring that to you, to bring the future developments to you. And I think it's going to interface rather well with uh, Jack Burke's presentation because I would like to go into a little bit more detail on some of the things that he talked about. Ah, here we go. So this is my synopsis, maybe. Seriously, finding, I think one of the big problems for people with MS in this very connected world is that there's lots and lots and lots of information. A lot of it is electronic on the internet, there are blogs, there are websites, there are people trying to sell you all sorts of things. Claims are made, counterclaims are made. The information is actually a massive information overload. So that people find it very, very difficult to, um, to sort through that information to, to find out what, what it really means. Um, are they on? One of the... Um, one of the things that I'll touch, later on, touch on later on is, for example, this whole stem cell debate. You know, not many people can actually nail down and say, stem cells is a treatment for MS, but what does that really mean? What do you expect the stem cells to do? Where do they come from? How, how do they get where they're supposed to get? Is this actually possible, or is it a kind of catch cry? So what I'm going to do first is to reintroduce the problem my way, I know that you've heard about inflammation and degeneration a lot already, but I'm going to do it again. So what goes on in the MS brain? And then I'm going to talk about one approach of finding a cause of MS. The best way to find a cure, probably the only way to find a cure for MS, or the multiple sclerosis, if there's in fact more than one disease in there, is to find a cause, or the causes. That's probably a long way off, but I'm going to talk a little bit about one approach that may deliver that. Short of that, there are new treatments that are going to be available, and I want to talk about the kind of approaches of new treatments, both targeting the immune system, but also the brain. And finally, Jack Birx has done a wonderful job, and I'm glad he didn't talk about the one symptom that I'm going to talk about, but I do want to just touch on symptomatic treatment as well. And and I think that that's actually as much of a frontier as the kind of more sciencey stem cell stuff. So this is information overload. For those, actually it doesn't project too well, but this is all in Japanese. <laughs> Nobody can make sense of all the information which is available. And we might smile, but we don't necessarily understand all that information. In fact, finding good information, finding what it all means, is a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack, or in this case, the fairy at the bottom of the garden. So, let's introduce the brain and the immune system. The brain is comprised of a of a cortex where all the nerve cells are. So all the nerve cells are the cortex means the rind. It's the outside of the, if we think about it as an orange, not a flattering comparison, but if we think about it as an orange, all the nerve cells are on the outside, on, in the rind. And the cables that are connecting those nerve cells are all running on the inside. So we need nerve cells to generate electricity and cables to conduct it. Nerve cells connect to each other by something called a synapse. So what happens really is that in this electrical system, if this one lights up enough, then this one will light up and so on, creating an electrical circuit, of course, of enormous complexity. And oligodendrocytes are very, very beautiful cells. What they do is provide myelin, the covering around the outside of, the, of most nerves. So the electricity is conducted in the cable here called the axon, and the myelin is tightly wrapped around that axon. One of these little cells can produce 
can wrap itself around up to 50 of these. Why do we actually need myelin? The purpose, we think, of evolving or having myelin is to aid the speed of conduction. I'd like to uh, illustrate that by something I call the oh shit response. <laughs> if you touch a hot plate, you have just enough time to think oh shit <laughs> before you feel the pain, right? Most of you have had that experience. The reason being that pain fibers, a very rudimentary kind of nervous system, are not myelinated. So the pain signal chuggle, chuggle, chuggles along into your brain, but the touch signal gets there first because it's myelinated. So this is a very practical illustration of increased speed of conduction by myelin. In fact, if none of us had myelin, we wouldn't have the speed of conduction to keep our body coordinated. We'd only be about the size, you know, of a squid. So we can only grow to the size that we are because of myelin, because it enhances the speed of conduction. And that's all well and good, and that's been understood for a very, very long time. But the myelin and the oligodendrocytes probably do something else. And this is something that Jack Berg's alluded to, and it's much more subtle than making you conduct faster. What they do is that they produce something which actually keeps the axons, these cables, and the nerve cells at the end of the axons, these nerve cells at the end of these axons, alive. It's called trophic support. It means that having the oligodendrocytes and having the myelin actually keeps the cable, the axon, and the nerve cells healthy. How do we know that? It was actually only realized in the 1990s, and the knowledge comes from mice. In mice, scientists have found ways of being able to knock out genes. What do I mean by that? Genes encode you, every part of you. There's a bit of a gene that makes your hair, a bit of a gene that makes the color of your eye, a bit of the gene that makes your skin. They also encode oligodendrocytes and myelin. So there is an instruction in your genes on how to make this. And basically, you know, there are hundreds of different components, as you might imagine, of this sheet, this, this myelin. And basically what was discovered is that if some of those components were missing, if some of those components were taken out from mice, which can be done, that this actually looked, the mice looked normal and they ran around normally and, and, and if you looked at them under the microscope, it all looked normal. But after about six months, which is, you know, solid teenage years for a mouse, it, uh, the mice started dragging their feet and they started to develop actually an MS-like disease. And what was going on was that subtle interferences in the oligodendrocytes and in the myelin were producing death of the cables and death of the nerve cells, even though its primary function of conducting electricity quickly was working fine. This, I think it's a very important point in, in understanding what I'm going to say later. So if we look at this again, a nerve cell, a cable, and lots of oligodendrocytes lined up, both to facilitate the speed of conduction, but also to keep that nerve cell and that cable healthy. The immune system is, we all have solid immune systems, and the major purpose of the immune system is to destroy invaders, bugs, viruses, bacteria. We all know that. Of course, MS is a big mistake. The immune system decides to attack the brain, and it's probably attacking the brain myelin directly. So, what happens is that we don't know how that mistake occurs. There are other autoimmune diseases where it might attack the joints or the, the pancreas if you have insulin-dependent diabetes, but the myelin is lost. This is a relapse of MS, loss of vision, numbness, weakness, whatever you may experience. 
So this causes a state of demyelination, loss of myelin. And here's uh, evidence of that from a person with MS. This is the uh, corpus callosum, a banana-shaped structure in the middle of the brain that actually helps your left side and your right side talk to each other. And because that connection is very fast, there's lots and lots of myelin there. And here we see a couple of these spots or lesions of MS, um, which are these areas of inflammation. But if, all that, if that was the entire story, everybody with MS would do very badly, and they would do very badly very quickly. And this is actually, what I'm about to say now is the major reason for hope, at least in the medium term. It's the repair process. The reason why attacks get better. And the reason why most people with MS, we think, don't progress right from the start of their disease and have this relapsing remitting phase is that the, uh, the repair processes of the brain are actually rather efficient. So if people with early MS happen to die for some other reason, a car accident or something, and their brains are looked at, the majority of the lesions with demyelination are actually repaired. And this is really, really important, and it's really, really unique as far as the brain is concerned. After stroke, which, is, uh, which causes loss of nerve cells themselves, if you lose the nerve cells and you lose the axons, they, they don't repair. But the myelin can repair, and it ha actually has an enormous repair capacity. There's a very rare human disease, where, which is very, very terrible, where all of the myelin in the body is lost at once. And these people have to go onto ventilators and in intensive care units for months. But actually, even that kind of insult, you can recover from. So you can actually regenerate all of your myelin. Just by the by, this is a, uh, an important thing to understand from the point of view of MS symptoms. The reason why, for many people with MS, when you get hot, when you get tired, when you're losing a lot of energy because of severe emotional distress, somebody has died, some tragedy is happening in your lives. Many people experience a, a recurrence of MS symptoms that have occurred because of a previous attack. And I've, I see some um, faces nodding, so I think I'm on the right track. And the reason for that is not new inflammation. The reason for that is simply that this repair job, as good as it is, is not perfect. The myelin, which is used for repair, is a spare part. It's thinner and each segment is a little bit smaller. And what, it hap what basically happens is that under conditions of low energy or a lot of heat, those, that speed of conduction is lost. So basically, you, when you put repaired myelin under stress, it doesn't work. And so once you cool down or things, um, you start to feel better, the symptoms disappear again. So this is why people often are revisited by previous attacks in the shower, at the end of the day, when they've done exercise or, or whatever. But over time, the attack continues and continues and continues. So like all repair systems, eventually this repair system gets exhausted. And in some people, this results in a permanent loss of the myelin. Now, from what I said at the start, the oligodendrocytes are very, very important in keeping nerve cells alive. So that we think the major reason why the, why the nerve cells die, and we think this is the major reason for secondary progressive MS, and is that, um, is that the, there's too much demyelination along the, uh, along the entire length of the axon, if you like, along the entire length of the cable, and that support that I talked about at the start just isn't there. But the consequences of this are actually very different in all of you. I look after probably about 500 people with MS now, and you know, they're all different. Everyone's different. And some people do incredibly well, some people do incredibly badly, most people do somewhere in between. But this kind of 
degeneration, which we've talked about, doesn't happen in everybody. And that's actually irrespective of the drugs. It just doesn't happen in everybody. So here's this uh, graph that you've seen lots of times before with attacks and remissions, and this is the kind of secondly progressive uh, disease depicted as a kind of disability level over time. And I've put 50-50 up here. Well, uh, you know, you can say, well, how do you know that? One of the tendencies for people who work in clinics with MS is actually not to see people who have fairly mild MS because they don't need anything sometimes. So what we did in Victoria was a genetic study, and at the end of the day, we captured more than a third of all people with MS, and this is widely advertised, MS Society, but also newspapers, TV. I think my boss even went on one of the Good Morning Australia shows, uh, Trevor Kilpatrick, who some of you may have uh, heard speak a couple of days ago. So this is a community of MS coming to the clinic, many of them coming to the clinic for the first time. There were lots of people who'd never even had an MRI scan because their MS was diagnosed before MRI scans were performed, and in order to be sure that they had MS, we had to do MRI scans on them. Some of these people were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and this is a graph of how long those people, this is the first 1,038 people with MS, had had MS. And this is a graph of their disability level. Now, uh, our first speaker this morning has had MS for 20 years, and based on what he said, I'd imagine him to be a dot somewhere around here. So this is a very, very mild level of disability. Uh, about here is uh, a walking frame, and further on is loss of arm function and so on. If we just want to orient ourselves in a graph like this a little bit, I'd like to draw a line here. This is the line at which people can walk half a kilometer independently. No walking stick, no frame, half a kilometer independently. Okay? And this is how long they've had MS for. Drugs for MS have only been around in this country for about 10, 10 years, 11, 12 years. So, you know, this bunch of people, 20 years, 30 years down the track, have often never taken any drugs. Some of them are well. The drugs are useful for some people, and I'm not saying that people shouldn't take a medication, far from it. I'm just pointing out that there are people who have had multiple sclerosis for almost 40 years who have absolutely no disability whatsoever as well. If we look at this 20 years, 30 years, 40 years down the track, you know, what this actually looks like is luck. <laughs> you can have good luck and you can have bad luck. And ending up here, after five or six or seven or eight years, it just wasn't meant to be. And ending up here, after 30 or 40 years of MS, that was just really good luck. So, why might that be? You know, why, why might there be this enormous spectrum of disease? Why do some people get so sick so quickly? Why do some people stay so well until they're 90 years old? And the reason is probably not just the intensity of the inflammation, but also what I've talked about for 15 minutes today, it's the capacity of the brain to repair itself. There's more and more evidence, and really we think that there are, there are some people who just have a brain that repairs itself wonderfully well, and in some people these repair processes just do not work very well at all. And there, therein, I think, lies at least some of the variability between different MS patients. And as you can see, all thousands of these are different. They're all different. So, I want to get on to treatments. And as I said before, the best way of finding a treatment is to find a cause. I think that the best chance of finding the cause or causes of MS is still genetics. The reason for that 
is that although this is not a strongly inherited disease, some of you in the room may have siblings, parents, or children with MS, but most of you won't. Even in the extended family, this only occurs in 10% of people. So nine out of 10 people don't have relatives with MS. So it's, there is a kind of factor of inheritance, and we can, we can see the genes a little bit. Uh, women, being female, triples the risk of having MS. That's clearly genetic. Being female or male is genetically determined, ultimately. Having a parent with MS, although the risk is low, about 2 or 3%, it actually increases your risk more than 30-fold. Being Caucasian increases your risk between 20 and 100-fold. So coming from England as opposed to coming from Japan, which is largely a small genetic difference, nonetheless makes a huge difference in terms of getting MS, because in Japan, MS is very rare. The, rel the relative risk, the increase in risk, if you're Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian, German, like me, is, uh, is 20-fold. And we only know definitely one other gene that's involved. There's an immune gene called HLA-DR2. I don't want to go into it, but it's actually a rather common gene. Um, about 15% of all of you, if this audience didn't have MS, about 15% of you would have this. And if this entire audience had MS, about 30% of you would have it. So it doubles the risk, but it's actually very common anyway. And we don't, still don't understand how that gene works after many years of research. I mean, how it works in the context of MS, why it increases your risk of MS. Of course, there's an environmental hypothesis. It's a toxin, it's a bug, it's a heavy metal poisoning, it's gluten, you name it. No proof as yet. We hope that there will be a bug because bugs may be very well treatable, but there's no proof as yet. And then there's also the random bad luck hypothesis. And that's probably true to some extent as well. You probably just stood on the wrong street corner or got up on the wrong side of the bed one day because there probably is my understanding of it is really this, that there is a genetic predisposition, a chance, an odd. You know, you're born with certain odds. Those odds might be very low if you're a Chinese. Those odds are much higher if you're a female English person who has two parents with MS. But they're still only odds. And that something converts those odds into the reality of, of MS. But finding even what determines those odds it's going to give us clues as to what causes MS and ultimately lead to you know, the most rational treatment of all, treatments that, that will address the cause of MS. Here's just a, a little bit on the, on, the, um, on the genetic risk. If you have one parent with MS, the risk is 3%. If you are a clone, and yes, clones exist, identical twins are clones. Identical triplets are clones. So if you're a clone of somebody with MS, that is, you share your entire genome, your genome is exactly the same, all your genes are exactly the same as the person next to you, an identical twin, you still only have a 30% risk. So that's the maximum risk that someone can carry is to be an identical twin of someone with MS, and still the conversion rate is only 30%. So this is what I was talking about, the genetic risk as opposed to a genetic certainty. So how do you find genes? One way of finding genes is to look in families. What I'm going to tell you now is actually a story of some disappointment uh, to many people in the room, not least uh, George Ebers, I think, who has invested a lot of his life in this, but it's not, hopefully it's not the end yet. One way of finding uh, genes is to look in families who have, where more than one person has the disease. So to say, this is called a, a, a linkage study. There might, might be some families who are somehow enriched for these MS genes, so we're going to try and find them, and we're going to compare that either to people in the family who didn't get the disease or sometimes to, to, to other controls. And this approach, you know, ha has not worked. The latest study has actually looked at 2,700 people with MS who share brothers or sisters or siblings with MS, and it hasn't 
found the signal, it hasn't found the cause. The other thing we can do, and this is kind of easier to do because, as I said, MS families are rather rare. They exist, but they're rather rare. Is to actually take a whole lot of people with MS and compare them to a whole lot of people who don't have MS. This is called an association study. These are kind of populations. You know, everybody is eligible. Everybody who has MS goes to the left side. Everybody who doesn't have MS goes to the right side. And we just compare whether there is some kind of genetic difference. And that is still not, that, that's been tried. And it's being tried right now again in the United States uh, with US and UK collaborators. And we hold out a lot of hope that this will work. So far, it hasn't worked, but the numbers have been small. So within the, hopefully, within the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to have some good news for this strategy. There's a third strategy, though. And that is to, to say, well, maybe, maybe we won't find the cause of MS. But what if we found the cause for bad MS? If we actually looked at people with MS and we said, OK, well, so you, after 40 years of walking into our clinic and you're perfectly well, you have benign MS, you have very aggressive MS, and we then compare the people who have really bad MS to the people who have really mild MS, we might still find the difference. We might find the reason why the people who have bad MS have bad MS. And that could be very, very valuable. And that strategy hasn't actually been tried very much. And that's the strategy that we in Australia and others are adopting now internationally to go down. It sounds like a hard slog. That's because it is. Now, briefly, I want to talk about a kind of mixed approach. We know that all people in Tasmania, no. We know that some people in Tasmania share greater relatedness than <laughs> people in. I apologize for the Tasmanians, but in actual fact, you may laugh, but this fact is, might well help all of you. So just thank them. <laughs> the, reason are, the reason is that in Victoria, uh, there was a gold rush in Victoria, so almost everybody who was in Tasmania basically left. <laughs> they did. There's only 12,000 people living in, Victoria, in, in Tasmania in 1870. And certainly, if you look at people who have grandparents with MS, many of them are descendants from those 12,000 people. It's just a fact. It's a big family. And in that family, there are people with MS. So one approach that we've adopted, trying to be smarter, I suppose, about genetics, was to say, well, if this is a very large family, perhaps we can do a study of of MS, because perhaps there's a particular gene which travels down from this particular ancestor in 1870 that we can see now in these people. Now, these people don't know they are related, but it, by and by, we find out that they're actually all fifth or sixth cousins, and they all have MS. So we've done that. A very, very large group of people has done that. And you know the results are quite encouraging. And hopefully, in the next 12 months, we're going to be able to tell you the exact result because you have to be sure about these things. But these, this is incomprehensible, of course. But these green things are the areas where the people with MS in Tasmania are different to the people who don't have MS in Tasmania, the healthy controls. Um, we have 23 uh, chromosomes. And, um, and this is just some of those chromosomes illustrated that showed some of those signals. Now, most of those signals didn't work out, but one of them did. What you have to do in genetics, because there's lots of false results, is you have to do it three times. You have to do it once, second time, third time. And when you do it the third time and it's right the third time, then you probably have a real signal. So for, for one particular one of these genes, if you like, we have done it twice in Tasmanians and in Victorians, and we're about to do it the third time. So if I get invited back to speak about this, in the future, or one of our team, hopefully, will actually have some real news. You know, millions of dollars of investment, many, many, actually, I'll show you. This is all the people involved, <laughs> including the MS societies of Victoria and Tasmania and the Tasmanian public. That's probably the biggest group of people involved here. 
but it's a very, very large effort, and we hope that in the next 12 to 18 months there's going to be some news, a little bit of light. So no cause yet, but what new treatments? I think, again, it's looking good. It's looking better. We know that the interferons and copaxone are partially effective treatments. They reduce the attack rate by 30 to 50 percent. I think that in the last five minutes or so, I'm going to make some predictions about what we're going to see. So first of all, inflammation. Interferon, copaxone are anti-inflammatories. Mitosantron is a stronger anti-inflammatory with more side effects. But I think that within a year, for people who have buckets of inflammation, lots and lots of attacks, and who are getting disabled rapidly because they have attack upon attack upon attack, you know, that's not most of you, but it might be some of you, there will be smarter anti-inflammatory drugs, such as uh, a drug called Tysabri, which maybe, for some people, within a year or so, we'll actually have in Australia. But more general news than that is tablets. We know that the injections are difficult to, tell, to take. The reason why the speakers spoke the way they did is that they know that the injections are difficult to take, and we're trying to encourage you to stay on the injections if you're, if you're on the injections. But, uh, but tablets, of course, are the great white hope, or orange or pink, or whatever they may be. Many people are looking forward to tablets. And I think that this is looking good, too. There are at least five different ones in advanced trials. And people with MS always ask me, how long? How long? Well, five years. I think in five years, there will be tablets on the market which will work for MS, and they will probably be um, at least as effective or perhaps more effective than any of the injections and less difficult to take. On the one hand, we have the immune system. On the other hand, we have the response of the brain. And there's actually an acute response of the brain. You have an attack. And basically, myelin might die or survive. Oligodendrocytes might die or survive. Occasionally, even a nerve cell might die or survive. And we're working on the factors to stop those oligodendrocytes and that myelin from, from dying acutely during the attacks, during, in these lesions. So what I'm talking about now is that your body actually doesn't just sit there and take it. The oligodendrocytes, the myelin, the brain produces a response to try and save itself. And we're starting to identify some of the factors involved in that response. So during an attack, I predict that within 10 years, we'll be given, giving people during attacks treatments that don't work on the inflammation, at that, but that specifically allow the oligodendrocytes and the myelin to survive better, and the nerve cells to survive better. Now, there's one more bit of good news, and in the last couple of minutes, a little bit about stem cells. This situation here, a situation where repair is exhausted, where the myelin is gone, and the re it's not regenerating itself, this was thought to be due to the repair process is just being exhausted, just stopping, no more myelin being able to be generated at all. No more new oligodendrocytes be, to be generated at all to wander in there and repair. It turns out that that may not be completely true, and this is another little angle of hope. Because in the last five years, what investigators, both in mice and men, have discovered, men as in people, have discovered is that one thing that happens is that oligodendrocytes, these cells producing the myelin, might actually be sitting there, right there. And they might be being inhibited from producing myelin. But the cells are often actually still there. And we are discovering at least three different factors, mostly in mice so far, but everything at the moment has to start in mice, we're discovering, we're discovering some of the reasons why they're not producing myelin. There are certain inhibitors there. If we can take them away, and these strategies are being developed right now, then we might be able to 
pr promote remyelination of long-term demyelinated axons. This is not using stem cells. This is using what's already there and just being smarter about tweaking the body a little bit. If you only have to tweak the body a little bit, it's actually likely to work. If you have to tweak the body a lot, it's much, much harder. Now, this here, this death of nerve cells, is, uh, is much, much more difficult. And there may never be a treatment that specifically allows nerve cells to survive, although if we can address this, we might be a part of the way there, because we think that this actually leads to that. Stem cells. What do stem cells have to do to help MS? So a stem cell comes from you, presumably, somewhere, the bone marrow or somewhere, and the idea is to reprogram that stem cell to produce myelin or to produce nerve cells for repair. So what would have to happen? Well, a stem cell injected somewhere has to go here, turn into an oligodendrocyte, and produce myelin. Currently impossible. Completely impossible. Or, you make the stem cell in the laboratory turn into a cell that already produces myelin, and then you put that in. Put that in. You know, it has to go into the exact right spot in the nervous system, or in the exact right two or three hundred spots in the nervous system. Because the problem, where we are right now, is actually fairly mechanistic. You can do that. I can take a stem cell from a mouse or a rat. I can turn it into a cell that produces myelin. I can put it into the lesion, inject it right into the spinal cord, inject it right into the brain, and it will produce some myelin. The problem is it does that only in the exact same spot where I put it. It doesn't move around. It doesn't proliferate and grow. So if I put lots and lots of myelin into that one, it, it, lots and lots of these cells, in, these stem cells, into this one spot, it does repair it a little bit. But in the human nervous system, there are just so many spots. You know, we can't, we can't turn everyone into a pin cushion and inject, you know, like a sewing machine kind of approach, where you inject these stem cells into 10,000 spots, because they don't move. On the other hand, if we take cells which haven't become oligodendrocytes, and we inject them into the brain or the spine, they do move. But they don't know how to turn into oligodendrocytes and myelin. What they actually turn into is scar tissue. Useless. And this is actually, right now, for the last four years, this has been the exact technical barrier. If we found a cell that was still able to move, but to find these areas, and then turn into oligodendrocytes, then stem cell therapy would work. But this is the exact barrier to it at the moment. In the last 10 seconds, I want to just take a breather from that and talk about uh, symptoms of MS. Because I think when we talk about progress in MS research, this is often neglected. It's a very, very important area, because if we can take a symptom away, and I can tell you, the single most effective drug for MS that I've ever prescribed in terms of quality of life of a person going from there to there was a medication called Ditropan to relax the bladder. Because that particular person was getting up 25 times at night, they weren't ever getting any more than half an hour sleep, and this is not, I know that this is not everybody's story, but for some people, a simple little bit of medication can make a vast difference. Suddenly this person is sleeping four, six, eight hours a night. You know, they might get up once rather than 25 times. Bladder symptoms are extremely common in MS, and they really take two, two forms, frequency and urgency, having to go frequently, or hurrying and just getting there, or difficulty starting, which is kind of the opposite, um, where people need to keep on going back to the toilet because they feel they're they haven't emptied their bladder completely, and this is often the type of bladder symptomatology that's associated with frequent infections. I'd like to encourage you, if you suffer from these, to talk to your doctors about it. It's also an area of some embarrassment. You know, we don't talk about our bladder, we don't talk about our bowels, and we don't talk about sex in, in public. And often people are a little bit reluctant to mention these things. And just mentioning them 
may help quite a lot because most symptoms of MS are very difficult to treat. I think we've heard some good fatigue management plans. Some of these work somewhat, you know, shaking or tremor is much, much harder. Uh, sexual dysfunction can be very hard. But there's one area where you can see people have a huge difference in their quality of life. You know, from here to here, and not just one, but lots of people. So the strategies, including the change in fluid intake patterns, the kind of medications which are available, and intermittent self catheterization can make a vast difference to people. And I think that this is also an area of research that we all need to encourage, because if it's about quality of life, then these kind of things can make a huge difference to quality of life. So if you suffer from these symptoms, talk to your doctor about it. Look, I just want to thank you all for listening to me. Um, and I don't want to pretend that the road ahead, you know, is straight, narrow, and clean. It's really going to be like that. It'll still be a cobblestone path, but we can identify some of the steps, and we can see those steps now in one year, in five years, in ten years. Better immune treatment, and finally treatment to actually restore some of the myelin, which might already be there, and just waiting for that little tweak to grow again. So I think personally that there's, you know, the, the path is rocky, but there's a lot of hope. Thank you very much for listening.